Ladies and gentlemen, once again, uh, welcome our esteemed visitors, audience, virtual audience, uh, to the lockdown lecture series of the Nehru Science Center, Mumbai. Um, on behalf of the Nehru Science Center, uh, National Council of Science Museum, the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome um, today's um, distinguished speaker, uh, Professor B. N. Jagtap, who is a senior faculty member in the Department of Physics, um, right now in the esteemed the Indian Institute of IIT Bombay. Um, before joining IIT Bombay, um, Professor Jagtap Sar uh, actually worked as a distinguished scientist and director uh, in chemistry group at the Bhava Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. Um, he's recipient of uh, awards and honors, including Homi Baba Award for Science and Technology, Senior Visiting Fellow of the Center for Chemical Physics uh, Canada, Professor Rai Dastidar uh, Award for Atomic and Molecular Physics, Platinum Jubilee Lecture Award for Indian, Indian Science Congress. I mean, he's a um, highly distinguished speaker. We're extremely honored that uh, he is here. Uh, before I hand over the, the mic to you, sir, to platform to you, I would just like to inform our uh, audience that uh, you know, each one of you um, normally look up to some role models. In, the, in science, one, if one has to look out for the role models, the, the highest one are those who have got the, uh, the coveted uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, for example, C.V. Raman from, in, from India, he got the Nobel Prize. So, sir, and from the other side, from, I mean, one is from the sciences side, other side, uh, we have, you know, this, uh, the Bharat Ratna, Padma Vibhushan and things like that. But when it comes to services, uh, we have the Indian UPSC exams have just been announced. People all look up to those, uh, the people who have got uh, the high ranking civil service people. So before the Indian administrative service came into picture, <laughs> we got the Indian, I mean, uh, independence. Uh, the Britishers have had what is known as the Indian civil service. Indian civil service was one, one uh, you know, which was a highly... Um, coveted post, uh, which um, I mean, everybody wanted to be an Indian civil service officer. In fact, uh, even C. V. Raman, uh, just because he couldn't travel uh, some, uh, to appear for the exam in yes. London, he actually appeared for accountancy exam and became Indian Audit and Account Service Officer. Uh, but our own, I mean, there are several such examples. Sir has got a beautiful connect between uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908 and the Indian Civil Service exam of um, um, 1895. I think uh, the suspense will, uh, I will not, uh, I mean, I will definitely hand over the stage to you, sir. I think you, you can take over from here, sir. And uh, please, we are very honored that you have kindly accepted our uh, invitation to be a part of this uh, lecture. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth. Warm greetings to you all on the eve of uh, 74th Independence Day. It's indeed an honor, proud privilege to deliver a talk at Nehru Science Center, and that too on the eve of Independence Day. I thank you for this honor. This talk is more like a storytelling. Uh, I must agree that this is an untold story and very fascinating story. I personally enjoyed it very much. And thanks to a bit of research in history of science, I am here to share this story with you. The narrative today is modeled on a typical Hindi Bollywood film. You know, this is we watch these movies and we enjoy them. So I, I thought I'll model this narrative on a Hindi movie. You begin with a very small storyline and then you keep adding plots and subplots and subplots. And with every plot and subplot, lots of characters come into the movie and it becomes a wholesome entertainment. So that's what I'm going to do. Of course, there are two cardinal rules. First one is to keep the suspense intact until the end of the story. And the second one is have some moral of the story for everyone who is watching it. So I'm going to do that. And uh, you can also see here that uh, the Hindi movies with the long titles, they generally do well on the box office. You may, be, you may remember Kayamat Se Kayamat Tak and Albert Pinto Ko Gussa Kyo Aata Hai. So taking little bit the inspiration from that, I have such a huge title for my presentation. So certainly it will go well on the box office. And uh, while I'm speaking today on the eve of uh, 
Independence Day, I'm going to connect a lot of stories about the Indian independence movement and the history of British India, all intermingling the main storyline. So let's begin. Uh, the first, let me introduce you to the settings. Now from the title, you know, there are two settings here, which I'm going to use. And the first one is the Indian civil services. These were also called as the imperial civil services. And these were the most elite and coveted uh, civil services uh, in, of the British Empire. Uh, and that was during 1858 to 1947. And ICS officers were responsible for overseeing all governmental activity in the 250 districts that comprise British India. So there were princely states and there were the British India. And today, you know, how many uh, districts we have? 739 districts. So we have too many districts today. Uh, the ICS officers were appointed under the section 32nd of the Government of India Act 1858, enacted by the Parliament of the United Kingdom. And this is another piece of information one must know that ICS was headed by the Secretary of State for India, a member of the British cabinet. So there used to be a separate ministry for India. Uh, the Indian civil services, uh, this was a permanent civil service. It's a merit-based selection system through so the competitive examination held over the entire British Empire. So any citizen of the British Empire could appear for this examination. And therefore, it was also called as the imperial civil services. Let's just look at uh, uh, what were the things for this uh, examination. The candidate had to be aged between 21 to 24. The entrance examination used to be of 1900 marks. And successful candidates were to undergo one to two years probation at University of Oxford and Cambridge and the School of Oriental Studies at Trinity College. And the officers had to serve for 35 years. Many of you may remember that when the Seventh Pay Commission discussion was on implementation, Many people were saying, oh, we are going to bring in that 35 years of service. Well, that was an old hat. It was used by the Indian civil services. But then you can just keep adding these numbers. If somebody joins at the middle of these ages, 22, 23, takes uh, one to two years of training at this uh, University of Oxford and Cambridge and serves for 35 years, he will be 60. And that is how the retirement age in India was fixed at 60. Sometimes a younger candidate would retire at 58, so we still have that retirement of 58 years still on in the country. Now you must be wondering what these pillows were taught. Criminal law, law of evidence, institutions of India, revenue system, Indian history, and the language of the province. Now, this evolution of Indian civil services, I must tell you a lot of stories about this. This all began with the Battle of Plassey. That was 1757. Now, this Battle of Plassey is a major event in the world history. However, we Indians do not give that sort of an importance to this. Well, this battle, the end, at the end of this battle, this was the beginning of colonization of India as well as Asia and Africa. This is a major event. Uh, you know the story. There was uh, the Nawab of Bengal was Siraj Uddawla, and it was a fight between. It was a war between Siraj Uddawla and Robert Clive, who represented British East India Company. Uh, Siraj Uddawla's uh, commander in chief was Mir Jafar Ali Khan, who defected in the middle of the battle ground, and Siraj Uddawla's fifty thousand. Uh, strong army was defeated by 3,000 men of Robert Clive. The battle lasted for 11 hours. And that is all, and that is where the colonization of India began. It was to happen, you know, and in 1757, India was contributing 25% to the world GDP, whereas England was contributing only 1.8%. So these events were there, but we were not very uh, particularly thinking at the word level. 
Now, there is another story, interesting story that somebody might tell you that uh, this war took place in June. There were a lot of rains in Bengal that time. And uh, Robert Clive had, uh, had a foresight of uh, taking tarpaulins along with him so that he can keep the gunpowder dry. Whereas uh, Siraj Uddhala did not have that foresight. So finally, the Siraj Uddhala was killed and Mir Jafar was installed as Nabab as the British puppet. And in turn, Robert Clive and the British East India Company was declared as the Diwan of Bengal. Now you remember, now you understand the story in a different perspective. Before the Battle of Plassey, there was only one Nabab. But once the British East India Company became Diwan and uh, uh, later the Nabab of Bengal, every employee of British East India Company was behaving like Nabab. How do you sustain the aspirations of so many Nabobs? And that ended in a lot of corruption, plundering, and atrocities on the people of Bengal. And this is where uh, the Indian services begin. In 1757, the East India Company created Covenanted Civil Service, whose members signed covenants with the company's board of directors. And there were so many atrocities that uh, this Battle of Plassey and these atrocities have another connection with, the, with America. Uh, in 1771, you had the big, great Bengal famine. And the number of people died in that famine were somewhere between 4 million to 10 million. It's a huge number. No one talks about it. And uh, these atrocities which happened in Bengal, they were on day-to-day -day basis were communicated in America. And that time, America was fighting its own war of independence. The settlers were using this information from Bengal and trying to convince the fellow members that, look, if the British can do this sort of atrocities on the people of India, then if they rule us, this is all going to be our fate. And that uh, gave rise to an added uh, spirit to the battle, the war of independence in America, and the America got the independence in 1776. This connectivity of uh, the Battle of Plassey and the first war, the war of independence, American war of independence needs to be established. Now, because of these atrocities and so many things which are, happy, which are happening in the British East India Company, 1773 British Parliament enacted Regulation Act and which established the post of Governor General. And this act was short-lived in 1784. You had the Pitts India Law established the principle of governance in India. And this is where the Lord Cornwallis split the bureaucracy in two parts. One is the political branch, that was to needle the kings and a commercial branch. That's for the trade. The first war of independence, it was 1857. And 1858, India got the first modern civil services. That's the imperial civil services, also called the Indian civil services. And the first Indians to qualify for ICS was Satyendranath Tagore, the elder brother of uh, Ravindranath Tagore. That was in 1863. And there were very few people in ICS. In 1871, there were four. In 1883, there were 12. In 1915, there were 63 Indians. In 1912, uh, Islington Commission recommended class one and class two services. I was reading the history of British India. There one author said, oh, the British understood the Indians so well. The Indians believe in their class systems and caste systems, so they created the services also based on this. And that, that author also said the number of posts in British uh, bureaucracy were almost same as the number of caste and subcaste in India. It, it, may, it may be a coincidence, but this is what the uh, British understood as so well. And that's why they could rule for so many years. In 1919, Montingo Chelmsford report accepted the demand for Indianization of bureaucracy 
in Government of India Act. Uh, we'll talk about it a little more on this particular thing. And as Dr. Kenneth said, the ICS examinations used to uh, take place in Britain, in England. So from 1922, the ICS examination began to be held in India. There's some beautiful photographs of the ICS officers. Uh, in 1926 was the formation of Public Service Commission of India. And in 1935, they had a public service commission for each province. This is all we have inherited from the British. And when India became independent, there were 322 Indian ICS officers and 688 British ICS officers. And in 1951, the Section 3 of All India Services Act 1951 established Indian Administrative Services. That's the, that is the IAS that what we have. Now I have brought to you some wonderful pictures of this civil servant, imperial civil servants in British India. You can see the Memsab there and there are Khan Sumar and so many people the serving the British officer. And this particular service, uh, this was an aspiration of every Indian to get into these civil services and enjoy. Uh, this, these people were essentially living like kings. Even after 70 years of independence, we still have fascination for this service. The new form, that is IAS. And just when the UP, you know, Uttar Pradesh, board examination results were declared, I saw this news item. With Abdul Kalam as role model, UP board class 12 second topper aspires to be IAS officer. I keep wondering, why do you have Abdul Kalam as the role model if you want to be an IS officer? Or is it going to be just a style that you say that, oh, Kalam is my role model, but I'm going to do uh, anyway, apply, for, uh, appear for the ICS examination. The second plot is about the Nobel Prize. Uh, we know all about it. The foundation for the prize were laid in 1895 uh, when Alfred Nobel wrote his last will leaving all his wealth to the establishment of Nobel Prize. Although this was established in 1895, the first Nobel Prize was given in 1901. You know what was happening in his five years? The relatives of Nobel, Alfred Nobel, uh, they disapproved uh, uh, this, his will, and they were contesting the battles in the courts and so on and so forth. But finally, by 1900, it was all settled, and you have the first Nobel Prize given in 19. So since 1901, the Nobel Prize has been honoring men and women from all corners of the world for the outstanding achievements in physics, chemistry, physiology, medicine, literature, and the work of peace. And the Sweden's uh, Central Bank established Nobel Prize in Economics in 1968. And the prizes are awarded on 10 December. This is called the Nobel Day, the death anniversary of Alfred Nobel. And we all know, I'm not going to spend time on this. Okay, this, the, all the awards are not uh, awarded by the same agency. The Royal Swedish Academy of Science awards Nobel Prize in Physics, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and uh, uh, Severinje's Risk Bank Prize in Economic Sciences. The Swedish Academy awards the Nobel Prize in Literature. The Nobel Assembly at Karen Linska Institute awards Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, and the Norwegian Nobel Committee awards Nobel Peace Prize. So everybody has to work hard for all this. Well, the Nobel made a lot of money, and he made his money using uh, discovery of nitroglycerin, blasting caps. He invented dynamite in 1864. In 1875, he invented more powerful form of dynamite, blasting gelatin. And in 87, invented ballistite, the smokeless nitroglycerin powder, held 355 patents. In 1895, he left 31 million Swedish kroners for establishing Nobel Prize. And the fund value today is about 4.5 billion Swedish kroners. And if you get Nobel Prize all for yourself, Nobel Prize money is 9 million Swedish kroners. And the exchange rate is here, one Swedish kroner is 8.62. So remember, if you get the full share of Nobel Prize, 
is going to be about eight crores, rupees eight crores. Remember that number, we'll use it at some point later. There are some interesting facts about Nobel Prize. There were years when the Nobel Prizes were not even. And most of them are the war years, First World War as well as the Second World War. You can see 1916, 1917, 1919, 1940, 1941, so on and so forth. However, there is one distinct uh, year here. You can look at the Nobel Prize for Peace, 1948. It was not given in 1948. And that was in the honor of Mahatma Gandhi. You all know that Mahatma Gandhi was first time nominated for Nobel Prize in 1937. It was not considered. Then second time he was nominated in 1947. And that nomination was received by the Nobel Committee through a telegram sent by B.G. Kher, who was uh, Prime Minister of Bombay Presidency, then Malwankar, who was the Speaker of uh, National Assembly, and Govind Wallop Pan was the pre premier of uh, uh, United Province. Uh, but it was not taken care. What largely uh, influenced the Nobel Prize Committee in 1947 was uh, uh, the partition of India, which uh, ended up in uh, taking so many lives. So they really didn't think that it was a peace, uh, uh, Nobel Prize in peace, but it was not Gandhi's fault. In 1948, there was a nomination for Mahatma Gandhi. And just before the nominations were to be closed, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. Now, there was a question that a nomination was received. So do we give uh, an award posthumously? Well, there are certain uh, conditions under which the award can be given posthumously, that is, if the Nobel Prize Committee takes a decision to award a Nobel Prize to a person and then the person dies, in that case, the award can be given posthumously. In this particular case, the Nobel Prize Committee had not taken a decision. So while they discussed it, uh, they also said that, well, it can be given posthumously provided Mahatma Gandhi has some organization or, or has some will. However, uh, there was no will, and therefore they decided that uh, we will not give Peace Nobel Prize in 1948. Uh, and the statement uh, that was issued that there is no suitable living candidate to award Nobel Prize in Peace in 1948. And uh, one of the comment in the Nobel uh, Committee was, in this respect, Gandhi can only be compared to the founders of religions. So this is the kind of uh, glowing tribute the Nobel Prize Committee had. Now, later in 1989, Dalai Lama received the Nobel Prize for Peace. And in his award-winning speech, Dalai Lama dedicated his uh, Nobel Prize to Mahatma. Well, there are people who got multiple Nobel Prizes. John Bardeen got for physics twice, Marie Curie twice, Linus Pauling once for chemistry and once for peace, and uh, Sanger got twice for chemistry. There's a very interesting story about John Bardeen. Customarily, a Nobel Prize winner is supposed to take his spouse for the Nobel Prize award ceremony. But this John Bardeen was more like Indian. He was more interested in his children's studies, so he told his wife, that you take care of the children's studies, I will go and receive the Nobel Prize. So when he was went for receiving the Nobel Prize, the King of Sweden asked, where is your better half? And John Barden had no answer. He said, okay, I'll bring her next time. So I had to work hard and get his second Nobel Prize. That was in 1972. Uh, this particular thing is uh, what is happening in the recent times. You know, the age of Nobel laureates, Average age is 59 years. The youngest is 17 years, Malala. That was for peace. In physics, it is 25 years, Bragg. However, oldest, we are now going to the, the Nobel Prize for older people. 97 years, John Gurren for the Chemistry Nobel Prize 2019. 
for the lithium ion battery. 96 years, Arthur Ashkin, physics, 2018 Nobel Prize, optical traps. The 19 is uh, Harvest for the economics Nobel Prize. 88 years, Raman Davis for the physics, 2002. And uh, Nambu, he should have got it much, much earlier. Got it at the age of 87 years, the physics Nobel Prize in 2008. The time between discovery and award, well, the average time is 20 to 30 years. So if you do work today, you can expect it sometime within 20 to 30 years. The longest was uh, the Physiology Nobel Prize. It was awarded in 1966 for the work done in 1910. So after 56 years, the shortest, of course, this record nobody can break. Yang and Lee received the Nobel Prize in 1957 for the work done in 1956. We also know that there are people who turned down the Nobel Prize. You remember Bob Dylan in 2016. Of course, there are plenty of other people like Sarth declined in 1964. The Vietnamese leader Tho declined in 1973. Boris Pasternak, he declined under pressure in 1958 and accepted, but later it was accepted by his son in 1899. Very interesting fact, the Jews account for 20% of the Nobel Prize winners, despite being only 0.2% of the world population. And for us, the numbers are exactly reversed. We account for 20% of the population and we have less than 0.2% of the Nobel Prizes. And there are only 53 Nobel Prize winners are women out of 923 prize winners till 2009. And if you want to know where this woman Nobel Prize winners belong to the Peace 17, Literature 15, Physiology Medicine 12, Chemistry 5, Physics 2, and Economics 2. Now, so therefore, when you go to a college, you go to a university, you talk to this woman and say that you work hard and you try to get a Nobel Prize. Professor C. Raman said that, well, if the women of India take to science, they can do much better science than what men can do. Science requires quality, which is called devotion. It's a passport for doing good science and women have it in plenty. So sensitize the women. If any one of them get Nobel Prize, it will add one to the kitty of women and also add one to the kitty of India. So it will be a double benefit. Now what I'm going to start the storytelling and there are three and a half characters in this particular story. And this particular terminology I have taken from the history of Deccan in the 18th century. In the 18th century on the Deccan, there were three and a half wise men. One wise man was defined as somebody who is good in diplomacy and also good in warfare. Good, uh, uh, play with the swords or the guns, as well as you can strategize. So there were full wise men, three, and there was Nana Fadanavis, who did not know the art of uh, fighting, but he was a great strategist, so he was a half man. So I have exactly like this three and a half men in this story. So let me turn to the first character and introduce these characters to you. The first character is Rudaford. He is the person who got Nobel Prize in Chemistry, 1908. Well, uh, during 1890 to 1894, he studied at Carterbury College, New Zealand. 1895, he was awarded scholarship to do research under J.J. Thompson at Cambridge, worked on the electric conduction of gases and radioactivity. <clears throat> in 19, 1898, joined McGill University, Canada, discovered radon with Harriet Brooks as his student and the spontaneous uh, radioactive decay with his student, Frederick Sodi. 1907 joined Manchester University, showed that the alpha particle were doubly ionized helium atoms. 1911 is the celebrated scattering experiment and he proposed the stationary atomic model. He shifted to Cavendish laboratory in 1990 and discovered proton. There are nice interesting pictures of uh, Rutherford with uh, J.J. Thompson and there is uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, Rutherford in the, in the laboratory. Now I must tell you a 
little story of the 1908 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It's a subplot. When uh, Rutherford received the Nobel Prize, he was not very happy. And he expressed it in his Nobel lecture. What he said, I have dealt with many different transformations with various period of time, but the quickest that I have met was my own transformation in one moment from a physicist to a chemist. The physicist getting a Nobel Prize in chemistry, well, Rutherford was not happy about it. How did it happen? And this is what we'll, we'll see the games which are played in award committees and so on and so forth. Very interesting narration. This is also part of the open literature. The mystery of 1908 Nobel Prize in chemistry. Uh, he was first nominated for Nobel Prize in 1907. He had seven nominations in physics and one in chemistry. The nominators for the physics Nobel Prize was Alfred, Adolf Baer, Hermann Ebert, Zerny, you know, Zerny Turner Mount, Emil Fisher, Phillips Leonard, Leonard John Potential, Max Planck, Emil Warburg, and the chemistry nominator was uh, Swante Arrhenius of Sweden. And he was a member of Nobel Prize Committee for Physics for 27 years. Now the report of the Physics Committee, 1907, Nobel Prize, his observation of the decay of a chemical element should be awarded with the chemical Nobel Prize. What a great uh, suggestion. Whereas the chemistry committee, 1907 said, Rutherford has been nominated for a study of radioactivity by seven nominators for physics prize and one nominator for chemistry as well. This is understandable taking into account that Rutherford used physical methods while the results so far as they are concerned with the chemical elements must be considered to be of fundamental importance for chemistry as well. Well, he did not get. Both the reports were not in favor. So in 1907, the Nobel Prize, physics Nobel Prize went to A. A. Michelson, and the chemistry Nobel Prize went to Gutner. In 1908, Rutherford had five nominations from physics and three in chemistry. The physics nominations were Arrhenius, Leonard, Max Planck, Warburg, and John Cox. And the chemistry Nobel Prize nominators were three. Uh, well, Max Planck provided a recommendation which was not considered very strong. His recommendation read like, for his experiments and research on radioactivity, and for having to some extent swept away the blanket of darkness that still enwraps the nature of this place. To some extent, that word was not really very liked. The Oscar White man, he said, Rutherford should share the prize with his former student, Frederick Stoddy. So another, uh, whereas uh, Rudolf Westerner said that this Rutherfordian idea is of much importance to chemistry, that I have no problem recommending him for the chemistry prize, even though he is a physicist. Now this conflict kept on happening in the chemistry and physics committees. His own guru, J.J. Thompson, submitted a nomination for 1908, but it was received late and it was kept for 1909. Now the report of the physics committee in 1908. Rutherford's work is more related to chemistry. And if the academy should decide it is not proper to give him physics prize, he should be awarded 1908 chemistry prize. Whereas the chemistry committee submitted a 15 page report. Rutherford's theoretical work contains the formulation and development of the so-called decay hypothesis for describing the transformation of element and deducing the laws that govern them. He has proposed that the alphas are doubly charged helium atoms has insisted on material nature of elimination process and has done experiments to verify his hypothesis. Rutherford has shaken the foundations of chemistry by replacing its assumption of the immutability of chemical elements with a new and more general hypothesis. And this further said, uh, the Rutherford deserves Nobel Prize in chemistry without a shadow of doubt. A more difficult question concerns whether any Rutherford's collaborator should share a prize with him. 
it is remarkable that none of the nominators other than Weidman has suggested that the Sodi should share the prize with Rutherford. A shared prize could easily be misinterpreted as an underestimation of the eminent importance of Rutherford's work for chemistry and more generally for modern natural sciences, especially the chemistry prize up to now has only been awarded to one noble, one laureate at a time. So it is only the precedence that decided that his students will not share the Nobel Prize. And 1908 Nobel Prize, the physics prize went to Lippmann and the chemistry Nobel Prize went to Ernest Rutherford. Well, he was nominated for physics Nobel Prizes in subsequent years. He was nominated 1922, 23, 24, 31, 32, 33, 37. They're all un unsuccessful. For example, in 1922, nomination was by Swedberg for the atomic model, Rutherford's atomic model. He wanted Rutherford to be awarded Physics Nobel Prize before Niels Bohr. The so Niels Bohr was also nominated in 1922 with the 11 nominations. And the award committee of 1922 has uh, such a remark, giving Rutherford a prize in physics would imply that 1908 decision to award him chemistry prize was wrong because the methods used in these discoveries are similar and Bohr model of atom is superior to Rutherford's. Well, in 1923, Swedberg repeats his nomination, including the discovery of proton. Uh, this nomination was undone by Arrhenius and he writes uh, very critical. Uh, there is very little sympathy for giving the same person two Nobel Prizes. None of Rutherford's countrymen have nominated him for the prize. You see that J.J. Thompson nominated him for 1908 Nobel Prize, but that nomination was received late. And none of his countrymen, so it is important that you are, if you are aspiring for Nobel Prize, your own countrymen should uh, nominate you. Sir Ernest's meritorious contributions are so great and widely known that his standing and possibilities to research would hardly be affected by a second prize. He already occupies the highest position in the British Empire. And with that, Rutherford's transformation for physicists to chemists was complete. Now, uh, there are very interesting quotes of Rutherford, and this is my pick. Uh, I like uh, all science is either physics or stamp collection. Very interesting. If your experiment needs statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. I have just finished reading some of my earlier papers. And you know, when I finished, I said to myself, Rutherford, my boy, you used to be a damn clever fellow. This is very interesting. All physics is either impossible or trivial. It is impossible until you understand it, and then it becomes trivial. More physics you have, the less engineering you need. Well, that's, that's a message we should give to our national laboratories. And finally, this is the one which I like the most. Should a young scientist working with me comes to me after two years of such work and asks what to do next, I would advise him to get out of science. After two, weeks of, two years of work, if a man does not know what to do next, he will never make a real scientist. The second character, the second character is William Sinclair Maris. As a contemporary of uh, uh, Rutherford, and he is the man who topped the Indian Civil Services examination in 1895. So now I'm slowly releasing that. Uh, now, uh, William Sinclair educated in Wangwai Collegiate School, and then he studied in Canterbury College. New Zealand and Christchurch at Oxford. And uh, you can see after he uh, uh, successfully topped the ICS examination in the whole of British uh, Empire, what has happened to his career? 1896, he was assistant magistrate at the United Province. 1899, became undersecretary to the government of UP. 1901, undersecretary to the government of India. 1904, Deputy Secretary. 1910, uh, Magistrate Collector Aligarh. Well, we'll go through this. Uh, 1919, Joint Secretary, Government of India, Reforms Commissioner. 
1921, governor of Assam. 1922, governor of United Province of Agra and Aunt. In 1928 to 29, he was a member of Council of India, and then from 1932 to 34, he was the Vice Chancellor of the Durban University as a translator of Homer, Odes of Horace, and so on and so forth. A very very highly successful civil servant. And uh, this is where I have his uh, who was who 1941 to 50. And you can see here, Mary, Sir William Sinclair, uh, and so many things, so many positions he held. Uh, Vice Chancellor of Durban University, the publications, and so on and so forth. Some of which I showed you in the earlier slide. He was Governor of United Province of Agra and Aunt. If you go to uh, those who are from Lucknow, you can recognize there is a Mary's Road there. This is that Mary's Road. It's from the Dargawadi all the way to the center point. This is that Marys Road, Lucknow, and uh, Marys also drafted the report of Montagu Transport Reform, which paved the way for Indianization of Indian civil services. I'll show you some more photographs. There is a Marys Market in Lucknow. Today it is known as Khatik Sabji Market. So you know what is being sold there, and he also established Marys College of Music. It is uh, since 1960. It is called as the Bhatkunde University of Indian Music. This is a very interesting uh, piece of information. Uh, the governor's camp. Uh, there was a seat. There used to be a seating arrangement, and it was a very sacrosanct thing. So there is who are the guests. So this is the table, oval table, and these are going to be the people sitting here, and so on and so forth. and this has to be approved and you can see on this paper how many signatures 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 13 signatures of approval and then finally it is approved here on the right hand bottom corner by maris this is that bureaucracy that we have inherited in my uh, tenure in the government service on the purchase file I used to be aghast to see 32 signatures on a file, and uh, this is what. Uh, well, what does signatures mean? I really do not know. Who takes the responsibility? Finally, it was the Marys who was supposed to take the responsibility of this sitting arrangement, and the sitting arrangement is not uh, such a great one. Well, there are some old photographs, uh, not in a good shape. Uh, His Excellency Sir William Marys at the center at Bharatpur is sitting here. The Maharaja of Bharatpur is sitting third. His Excellency is right. Is he here somewhere? Here. Okay. Now, Marys and Gandhi had a meeting in Johannesburg. So I'll bring some piece of history from independence movement that was what Gandhi started in South Africa. Now, Marys was visiting UK, and he was on the way to India. Stopped at uh, South Africa. And there he right. since the botha government took office the agitation against indian migration had been gathering at the outset my sympathies were sympathy was inclined to the indians i disliked the way in which they were ranked with kafirs as colored people who may not walk on the side paths or get into tram with europeans and i thought that the officials dealing with the passport and registration question registration questions were ignorant and heavy handed and then he also describes uh, then one saw the other side of the question the extent to which the traffic in the false documents had gone so many of these indians were leaving in south africa with the false documents and then he says administrative council of botha government passed a bill requiring all indians in transvaal to read register there was a great protest those who were there illegally did not want to be ejected gandhi about whom at the time there was nothing whatever discernible of a scent or a mistake led the campaign and made the indians swear by quran or on cow's tail not to register again the appointed time expired and the law had been broken and the smuts arrested gandhi and put him in the jail 
uh, when then, then there were some negotiation and when the registration booths opened, Gandhi and one of his lieutenant stepped out boldly to be the first to re-register. There was a great trouble in the market square Johannesburg. And then he says, the suggestion was made that as I came from India, I might be asked to take a hand. I first went to see Gandhi, who was lying in a darkened room with his head bandaged, weak and hardly able to talk. And there was some settlement that these people had. The third character, the third character of the story is George Carmichael. And incidentally, this man taught the ICS examination of 1886. So Mary stopped the 1895 examination, whereas George Carmichael topped the 1886 examination. And his uh, career was uh, like this, 1880, it should be realized 18, 1887, assistant collector, and then assistant commissioner at Burma. And then he was, uh, he spent a lot of time in Bombay. Uh, then he became the chief secretary of revenue and finance, and then the Governor's Executive Council and retired in 1921. Some of the old timers may know the Carmichael Road in Mumbai. You can just see here, this is a Mahalakshmi here. This is a bridge candy. And uh, this is the Jaslok Hospital. And this is the Pedder Road. And from the Kem Corner, there is a road which goes parallel to the Pedder Road. Is that Carmichael Road. This is named after the same George Carmichael. Currently, it is named as ML Dahanukar Mark. And uh, this Carmichael Road is the official residence of Governor of Reserve Bank, Chairman of Port Trust, Municipal Commissioner, Mumbai, Council Generals of Japan, Belgium, China, and also the Indian industry leaders. I thought of bringing some pictures of the Carmichael Road, the buildings around that yeah, as today. They are beautiful buildings. And if you inquire for the real estate price, the real estate price is something like 100,000 to 150,000 per square feet. Now you don't get one bedroom or two bedroom apartments there. You get four bedroom hall kitchen apartment costing 4,000 square mid feet will cost 44 crores. And now you remember if you single handedly win the Nobel Prize, you get paltry eight crores. Not enough to buy a house on the Carmichael Road. So if you want to really stay on the Carmichael Road, either you got to be a civil servant or an industry leader. Well, there's a half character, and that's the most important one. Then I'll begin with the story that we have. This is the Walter M. Son. He studied at the Charter House and the Trinity College, Cambridge. In 1871, he attempted Indian Civil Services examination in London and failed. And then in 1879, sailed to New Zealand. In 1886, he joined Varnoy College at School, Christchurch, and in 1988, he became principal. Now, George Carmichael was Emson's cousin. So now, let's keep connecting the characters. And the Emson was teacher of William Maris at Varnoy College, New Zealand. And the storyline is really very small. The year 1886, Wangai College at School, New Zealand, Walter Emson as the teacher, and William Maris as student. April 1886, result of ICS London Open Examination declared. Emson cousin, George Carmichael, had talked. Emson's mind turned to an unusually gifted student of his college at school, 13-year-old William Sinclair Maris, popularly known as Willie. Emson describes details of prospects of ICS services in India. When Willie showed interest in the ICS, Emson told him, you go for the Indian civil. And Emson plans for the studies of William Sinclair Maris. This was the year 1886. In the year 1890 to 93, the scene changes over to Canterbury College, Christchurch, New Zealand, with William Maris and Ernest Rutherford as students. 
Well, let me add something here. At a later stage, when William Waris was asked about Ernest Rutherford, do you know what he said? He said, Ernest Rutherford, in whom at that time was not apparent, the genius that was to win him immortality as man of science, and a grave in the Westminster Abbey. Every British person would like to be buried at that Westminster Abbey, the greatest honor for a British man. He was amiable and easy to live with, no player of games but a great walker, and with an engaging simplicity and lag, even compared with me of Sever Fair. He and I together began to read conic sections and differential calculus. Never for a moment was there a question of Rutherford's superiority. He could solve problems that let me dazzle. But either because he was nervous in examinations or did not trouble to be complete master of his book work, for three years, I successfully tried with him, tied up with him, and we shared the annual exhibition scholarship of 20 pounds. Now, in what context this was asked, we'll come to that a little later. Then comes the year 1893. The scene is at Canterbury College, Christchurch, New Zealand. William Marys tops the class. And this is the list of uh, uh, students who qualified. And on the top, you can see here, William Sinclair Marys. And the second one is Ernest Rutherford. And there was one scholarship, 1851 Exhibition Scholarship, to do research under J.J. Thompson at Cambridge University. It was awarded to William Marys and not to Ernest Rutherford. Here, 1894 to 95, well, Marys left for England to prepare for ICS open examination. Rutherford did research on electromagnetic signal, looked for a teaching position in New Zealand, but did not get one and comes the year 1895. William Marys tops the list of successful candidates from the entire British Empire. That's here, this is the result. You can't see it's a very old document. This is a William Marys is the topper of the ICS examination. So in the year 1895, Marys joins the Indian Civil Services. And at that time, he leaves his claim on 1851 Exhibition Scholarship. And then, since Rutherford was number two, that scholarship was offered to Rutherford to work under J.J. Thompson at Cambridge. Down the line, Marys became a very highly successful civil servant. Rutherford, a gifted scientist who contributed so immensely to our understanding of the physical world, and mentored a large number of scientists who further contributed to what we know today about atoms and their behaviors. And as Mary said, he was buried at the Westminster Abbey, where the British heroes like Isaac Newton were buried. Mary's, while giving those lines, was unhappy that he will never have a chance to be buried at the Westminster Abbey, like the Rutherford. This is where the story ends. This is William Marys, governor of United Province, with his office staff at Lucknow. And this is Ernest Rutherford in the company of Nobel laureates. Friends, there are too many questions that you can ask. I'm not going to answer those questions. You can answer for those. If Ma Marys had not got into the Indian civil services, and if he had joined J.J. Thompson, would he have the same atomic model? Well, some people will say that the atomic model was a necessity of that time. So whether it was Marys or whether it was Rutherford, somebody would have been there some Rutherford would have been there, would have invented that model. Well, we do not know. Second one, 
Second question you can ask, how much a teacher influences a student in the formative years? And that example which I showed you, the topper of a UP board, his teachers also must be like that himself. Telling the brightest of the kids every day that you appear for the Indian civil services or Indian administrative services. So on the face of it, you worship Kalam, but at the bottom of your heart, you have the aspiration to go for this IS exam. This is the role of teachers. What we have been doing is we as scientists and professors, we are taking this message of science to the people, but this message goes to those people who have crossed that formative age. And this is where we need a different perspective. The third, another thing is science always had competitive professions. You remember when uh, Paul Dirac wanted to do PhD in physics. His father asked me, you go all over Europe and find out how many positions for professor of physics exist in Europe, and then take the decision. So science always had a competition. It was not a first choice. And in this case, for William Marys, one of the brilliant bureaucrat, he could have gone to J.J. Thompson, but he waited for his result of Indian civil services and decided to continue and decided to go for bureaucracy. So this conflict always exists. And therefore, howsoever you try, I have been now when finally a word that I have been also discussing with many people. And there are lots of conferences and discussions take place. How do we attract students to science? And people have all kinds of suggestions. And I have only one suggestion. I tell them that, look, the students of today are going to choose a profession that gives them money. If I can teach my PhD student how to make money with the research that he has done, the brightest of the people will come to do science. With that, I acknowledge, uh, now this is where the much of the research on the history of this, this storyline was done by Dr. B.C. Pandey, Lucknow. I helped him a little bit. In fact, he wrote a book, Sir uh, William Sinclair Maris, and he has thanked me in that in the press. Uh, then uh, you can get all the information about Nobel Prizes in, on this website. And there are beautiful volumes, which, which are brought out by um, Arthiya Vidya Bhavan, The History and Culture of India, 11 volumes written by R.C. Mujumdar, must read for every one of us. And with that, thank you very much. Mm, thank you, sir. It was a truly fascinating, fascinating journey. And more so on the Nehru Science Center, most of the audience are school students. I think um, your address is in the right platform. Um, they'll think twice. Um, I mean, who their role model is and what they would uh, wish to be. Um, I think the, maybe we'll uh, see if there are some questions. Um, uh, Sanket, do you have any questions? I have mean, not. Hmm. Oh, uh, oh, no, it doesn't matter. I think. <laughs> Yeah, let it be, huh? <laughs> okay. This is uh, something very fascinating because I mean, my colleague just now told me that uh, uh, there are no questions, uh, but everyone is telling that we should have more lectures from uh, Professor Jekta. Um, it's very fascinating. It's uh, really been uh, very, uh, uh, I think each one of them are very happy about uh, the lecture that uh, you've given, sir. Um, it will immensely uh, motivate them. Um, since we have the uh, Independence Day tomorrow, um, I'll also share, sir, since sir has shared one, so much of information about the Nobel Prize and uh, um, the ICS, Alan Turing, who is considered as the, the father of the, the modern computers, he has a great connect with uh, civil services. His father and both his, you know, his wife's father, they were again Indian civil servants working here in India. Um, Alan Turing has a great connect with India as well.
Any any other questions, uh, Saket? No. <laughs> I was also yeah, Professor Jagdeep, and I was looking at some of the comments. Of course, I couldn't see all of them. Yeah. Everybody is uh, liking what you. I mean, the storytelling. The, I mean, I think each one of them are very impressed with uh, the storytelling. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I have. I used to always begin uh, my lectures with this slide. Can you see my uh, screen? Okay. Uh, see, we all always give the evening talks, and then I have been telling my friends, the senior people, look, what is the meaning of an evening talk? And this is what the picture which I show. A study of evening campfire conversation by Jew Hwan people of Namibia and Botswana suggests that by extending the day, the fire allowed people to unleash their imagination and tell stories rather than merely focus on the mundane topics. So the evening talks should should not be on uh, oh, the role of uh, these uh, uh, non-conventional energy sources in India and all. These are already serious talks. Talks should be such. Where both the speaker as well as the uh, listeners, they can unleash their imagination, and there is a storytelling, and that at the end everybody enjoys. And that that should be the style for the evening talks. Thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, just end this. Sir, when um, yeah. I just would like to tell that uh, these lectures, informal or formal ones, uh, they have played a profound role. Um, the best example is Michael Faraday. Uh, yes. who better to be have been uh, gr the great scientist that he is and we all yes. remember him for that yes. um again he was uh, a beneficiary of the the royal society lectures uh, yeah. which he now are known in his name as the uh, michael paraday royal uh, society lectures i'm sure your lecture um, which of course has been seen by some of the the people online uh, since it's going to be on our youtube channel there will be many many more students who will be seeing and let's yeah. hope that uh, some of the people um, who are toppers think twice as to whether they will go for science or civil service, depending on what uh, is uh, fascinating to them. And hopefully, we let's expect that some of them, the real bright ones, do opt for science and enjoy you know, the passion with which one can do science. Thank you very much, sir. On behalf of the Science Center, I would like to thank you.